How are you? If you don't have a chair, uh, you've got five minutes to grab a chair out of the hall uh, and uh, borrow, a chair. Uh, borrow a chair or sit on somebody's lap. Or <laughs> this is kind of a startup grind. So you know, this is very glorious uh, surroundings for us to begin with. So. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Michael Cayley. I'm the uh, director of Startup Grind Toronto. Uh, Startup Grind uh, is a uh, meetup and blog network that started uh, in Silicon Valley about three years ago. Uh, it was founded by a guy named Derek Anderson. Uh, Derek, uh, you know, started with three chapters. That uh, one is in Marin, one is in San Francisco, uh, and one is in the Valley. And uh, I think we were kind of the eighth chapter. Uh, to start uh, globally and over the last year, uh, there are now more than 40 chapters uh, in 20 cities, uh, no, sorry, in 20 countries uh, globally now. So it's uh, really emerged and, uh, uh, you know, uh, without saying too much, uh, uh, one of those famous names in technology uh, has uh, just recently signed on as a, as a global sponsor, so uh, you'll hear more about that over the course of August. I also run a startup called Seedling Capital Services. It's a ratings platform uh, to help build trust between investors, startups, and experts. Uh, we've been in development for a couple of years. We ran a series of pilots over the last year, uh, and we're just in the process of moving from a, an alpha stage product to, uh, to a beta, so you'll uh, be able to use that to help uh, uh, validate your startups uh, with investors and experts uh, over the course of the fall. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce uh, Jesse. Uh, Jesse is uh, the director, is that the correct title that you have? Uh, and our co-host this evening uh, for the Creative Destructive Lab and give him an opportunity to quickly tell you about the lab and, uh, and a little bit about what he's done. Jesse also, by the way, uh, was the founding director of the Velocity Program at the University of Waterloo, so he's been uh, helping sort out signal amongst early stage startups for over six years in Canada, so uh, a fairly experienced guy in that, in that regard. Thanks. Uh, I can do this so I can hear me. Really so the Creative Destruction Lab at Rotman is a program based just on the second floor here, um, and we're focused on building massively scalable companies um, and the university-affiliated kind of research network of, in, in Ontario and in, in Canada, but focus mainly on what's going on at the University of Toronto because that's where we are. Um, we generally don't work with apps. It's, it's, it's research-driven companies. And we run them through an eight-month program that is focused on a board of directors that we call the G7 that are folks like Dan DeVoe from Ripple, Nigel Stokes uh, from Data Mirror that sold IBM, uh, Dennis Betty, XTL Capital, uh, Nick Kudos is a professor at the University of Toronto but also sold the company, and, um, and Lee Lau from ATI Technologies, which was just a little, bit, little technology company in Canada. Uh, that only changed personal computing for everybody, made gamers happy. Um, and and there's a, this group of folks acts like a board for companies that come in and report to them every five to six weeks. This year, actually, we're extending it to eight weeks. And uh, they kind of guide the company through milestones and can get them going and see how they perform. What we do differently than any other program you're going to see around is it's, it's because of the milestones, because we get to see them perform, the low performing companies are removed from the program, so we start with 18 and an unknown number finished. This year it was eight. Um, and that included companies like, uh, that everyone's probably heard of, Ethelmic. Um, one you haven't heard of yet, we'll be buying them, you'll hear about them in September. And one that just announced their stuff last week, uh, Western Expressions. Uh, they just released something that turns uh, dumb screens into smart screens and attach a whole bunch of technology through HDMI port uh, that allows kind of phones to interact and you to interact with the screen. Really kind of cool technology. And when we worked with a company like that, he came to us with a relatively crazy idea, but really cool technology that figured out how to put screens into escalator arm rails, and that's how he's going to run his technology. Um, and worked with him to kind of shift that kind of thing. Uh, incredible company uh, to work with, and over time you get to see them evolve, and everyone kind of starts off one place with a startup, and, and it ends up somewhere else as they go, and that's uh, big thing that we're about here, and we, we work largely, again, it's, we're open to anybody um, loosely affiliated with, with any university, it's not just the University of Toronto, and we don't ask for any equity, we don't, we don't take anything from you, we ask that you participate with the MBA program here, um, but you don't have to, 
And uh, what we do offer, we can we can offer you for sure when you get into the program, social capital. Uh, and sometimes the financing comes along, uh, and at least with three of them, that was that was certain that's happened. But two more are probably likely. We'll see. But it, it was a, it's been an experiment. In its first year, we had a lot of success. Uh, we measure ourselves in equity growth, and in the companies. And this year, we our companies grew 16 million dollars in equity value, and you can only measure that through funding, events, or sale, and uh, and that's what we hold ourselves to as, as we go. Uh, pretty kind of crazy first year, um, and we are trying to plant ourselves more um, in the University of Toronto community, but the larger Toronto community. So I think a lot of people don't understand or realize the University of Toronto does $1.2 billion in research annually. Uh, and it's a fairly significant school on a global scale, uh, what's going on. So there's a lot of energy, a lot of technology, and some amazing research going on. So we're going to show you more of that. So that's, we're happy to have you all come here. Uh, join the Rockman community, and uh, hopefully we'll see most of you folks around again for another event. Thanks. Great. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for hosting us. This is uh, by far uh, the uh, the most glorious setting. I, you know, when we first started these, uh, we didn't have these signs, and we really just uh, stuck a piece of paper to a milk crate in the center. So uh, we, we really appreciate that. So a little bit about uh, the format. It's just a straight-ahead uh, chat between Bob and I. And... Uh, uh, you know, throughout it, I try to kind of have a three-way dialogue, so uh, we would encourage you to ask questions as we go. Uh, it's up to you to kind of get what you want out of the evening. Uh, the themes for Startup Grind are to inspire, so we'll hear some more stories, uh, to educate, so we'll hear a little bit about customer development uh, and uh, the methodologies that uh, Bob and Steve Blank uh, have uh, created and uh, evangelized. Uh, and then we'll try to uh, close with a little bit of uh, connecting to sort of what are the major trends in the startup world, both in the Valley and, uh, you know, what Bob is seeing globally in our, uh, as we go. We ask you to uh, quickly introduce your startup. How many people here have a startup? Right? So when you go to ask a question, you might be able to give us like a 10 or 15 second framing statement, at least introduce, try not to ramble. Uh, so that Bob has an opportunity to kind of zero in on uh, your general space. There's another tradition that is really not a Canadian tradition, but is, it a, is a tradition of startup grind, and I really need your help for, is that when we welcome a guest at any one of these startup grind chapters in 40 cities globally, we do it with a standing ovation and a wild rock star-like clapping and applause. This is not a very Canadian thing to do, but we've, been, we've had it done with some success. So I'd like to introduce our guest tonight. Uh, Bob uh, is a seven-time entrepreneur. Uh, he has had two successful exits. Uh, uh, he had a slide up earlier and had a, a phrase on that slide that said, uh, directly to toilet. Uh, and I think that described a, a, a three of the seven. Uh, and uh, he is co-author of a book called The Startup Owner's Manual, uh, which you will learn a little bit more. How many people have, have sort of delved into customer development? How many people have read, you know, uh, either Bob's work or Steve Blank's work online? Right. So, so you know, it's, it's interesting that I think among startups, uh, it's something that people... Uh, identify with quickly. Uh, I think probably we have a bigger job in Ontario uh, evangelizing the approaches uh, with, uh, with our potential investment pool. But without further ado, I'd like you to join with me and welcome Bob Dorf. Yeah, they're Canadians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, if you if you if you challenge them with that whole Canadian versus American thing, look out, buddy. Right, it, it goes nuts uh, right away. So, so uh, thanks thanks for uh, accepting the invitation. Uh, thanks for coming up uh, and doing all of this. A workshop this afternoon uh, and uh, this evening with uh, without uh, you know uh, any kind of speaker fees or anything like that. I really really appreciate it. Uh, Bob uh, has done a Startup Grind event in New York City. Uh, he has one coming up in Washington. So uh, we're, we're grateful uh, that the network uh, 
sort of uh, you know create an opportunity to bring you here to Toronto. So well, glad to be here. Yeah. Great city. I've been here God knows how many times. Always enjoyed it, and uh, nice to be back. Uh, so. Uh, you know, first of all, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe uh, talk a little bit. Uh, let's, let's start with uh, the best days of startup, of being in a startup. And, uh, and maybe, you know, that day that you closed the deal on the first exit that you knew that was life-changing. Or maybe there's a, a, a better day that is more inspirational about being a, a founder that really uh, is a story that you think, uh, you know, can help uh, people stick with it. I think the best, uh, I, I, the best moment in 42 years of startups, and I don't know if this is on or not, doesn't seem like it, but is that better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. The best moment in 42 years of startups um, was when we, we, despite my strong objections, uh, the senior partner in my last startup, Marketing One to One, Don Peppers, absolutely had to take in venture capital. And I said, Don, what do we need this for? We have $30 million in the bank. We're making money hand over fist. And um, long story short, we deci he decided we were going to do it, and I decided I was going to leave because I had sold one company where I wound up reporting to a board of directors before, and I realized the reason I liked being the founder was because I didn't have to answer to anybody, and I could bury my own mistakes and go on about my business. Um, whether they were employees or decisions, either way. Um, and so when so we brought in some top-tier Silicon Valley investors. We had a lovely problem, I wish, on all of you, seven term sheets uh, for the same company. Uh, we picked one, and they said, in your company, you have $36 million worth of public stock in companies that paid you in stock instead of cash. Get rid of it. Oh, okay, we know how to do that. You know, 32% goes to Bob, 43% goes to Don, 23 to Martha, and 6% goes to non-partner staff members, because I always believed that if you were a part of the company and you were an outstanding performer and you were with us more than a year, you should have a taste of whatever's going on in a growth company. So I took my pile of money, put it in my wallet, and then I had, as the CEO, I had the pleasure of going around to the admins, the secretaries, the tech support people to hand them their checks. And I handed a check to Corliss Brown, the receptionist at this company. Corliss Brown was a single mother of four, worked three jobs. But when you walked into our company, you were made to feel so welcome by this woman for seven years, right? Three kids lived in the ghetto of Stanford, which was a short walk from our sumptuous offices, and um, I handed her a check for $14,000, which was about two-thirds of a year's pay. And I got a hug. I think I still have cracked ribs from that <laughs> hug, which was in year 2001. Um, and... You know, obviously my check had a few more zeros in it, but the important thing was she worked her buns off for us for seven years, always had outstanding performance reviews, and was sort of the face of the company, and got a, by her standards, a really, you know, outsized reward for just doing her job diligently. And to me, that's something you can do in your startup that you can't do at, you know, GE or Dominion Bank or TD or, uh, you know, wherever. And um, I guess the other one was probably a little more personal where we, we did a bunch of deals in the my last startup, uh, a company called Marketing One to One, uh, later Peppers and Rogers Group, where uh, people, including Steve Blank, said, we need your help doing customer de development finding customers, figuring out our business model in this new world of CRM, but we don't have any money and we'd like to pay you in stock. And it led me to seven of my eight IPOs. And I still remember the first one was a company called Broadvision, where the day after Thanksgiving, I was driving to the gym, which is something I don't do often enough, um, and 
I heard on the, you know, and the stock markets in the states are open on the day after Thanksgiving. It's a business day, even though nobody goes to work. And I, just coincidentally, there was the business news on the radio. It's a quiet day on Wall Street today, except for Broad Vision, which is up thirty dollars in the first thirty minutes of trading. And I had tens of thousands of shares of this company that the day before was a sleeper and a, hey, I like this early stage investing stuff. This is pretty cool. Um, and unfortunately, in today's world, those opportunities don't exist quite as much. That was going to be my follow-up question. You said you just, you just said you were through eight IPOs? Yeah. What's an IPO? What's an IPO? <laughs> no, but I mean... <laughs> I mean, in, in, in domestic terms, <coughs> I mean, a technology IPO is a very rare event. And, yeah. and even as you were saying today, so you were, you were about to say right. uh, in the, the dark of IPO. Market. Right. In the first quarter of 2013, there, the number of tech, venture-backed tech IPOs in the United States in the first three months of this year is one. One. Not three, not four. One. There was one an hour in the second half of 1999. It was the most amazing sort of, uh, you know, if you think back to the Dutch tulip explosion of a couple centuries ago or the real estate explosion of 2006, 7, 8 that led to the real estate collapse. It was an extraordinary and likely once in a lifetime event, which leads me to probably the the, the most important sort of balancing thought in all of that is if you are here because you're doing a startup to get rich, go get a job. Go do something else. Because the odds post-99 of getting rich in a startup are so low that if you don't love what you're doing, love the challenge, love always living on the edge of crap, how am I going to pay that bill next week or whatever. <laughs> and most important, don't love the independence of being either the founder, the CEO, or part of the senior team in a startup. The wishes, hopes, dreams of bags of money are so ephemeral, so un relatively unachievable that you are going to just drive yourself insane. And if you love it, it will pull you through the many dark days that you will certainly, you are guaranteed to experience, even if your name is Mark Zuckerberg. That, you know, that startups don't go in a straight line anywhere unless it's into the toilet. Um, and so you have to be able to manage not only your own sort of attitude and energy and momentum, but that of the people around you. Steve Blank loves to talk about it as startup founders have to be able to create their own re reality distortion field. And if they're, the gentleman here from the press said, if I want one line to be off the record, this would be it. There is no better creator of reality distortion fields than Steve Blank. Um, in other words, right, and so here's an example of a Bob Dorf. This Dorf's. is a microphone, right? What? This is a, it's being recorded, right? There's no <laughs> oh, <one. laughs> Steve would actually consider that the highest compliment. Of course. So here's one for you. In about year six of my first startup, we were losing $2,000 a day, which doesn't sound like a lot of money and isn't a lot of money if you have a couple million dollars in venture capital behind you, but all we had was Bob Dorf's meager credit lines behind us, and most of those were pretty much out at 100%. And only I and the bookkeeper knew that we could only survive another 16 business days at minus $2,500, and then everything would be zero. And for my 25 employees, they couldn't know any of this. Every day had to be an up rah, rah, things are great, let's go get that account, let's go solve that problem. Because if they knew their remedy was close the door, work on the resume, start making phone calls, and my asset base would go down in the elevator. 
And so maintaining your enthusiasm, your optimism, and that is, is part of your job as a founder. So the, the 16 days, is that, would that, that captures one of the dark days? And, and no, that was nothing. That was nothing. Okay, was so, <laughs> okay, so, so well, take, us, want, to the, dark days? take us to a darker place and also... <laughs> how, guess, how much time have you got? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but, but I think it, as importantly, you know, what is it that sort of was, you know, kept you going? Got you up the next day, kept you, you know, were you able to push through? Well, I think that, that um, first of all, if you are truly an entrepreneur, there is a mutant strand in your DNA helix somewhere, and I'm pretty sure I have one. Because I, my father, when I told my father I was leaving this fabulous job to start my own company, he was sure I was out of my mind. He grew up in the Depression. He loved getting that regular paycheck with the health benefits and the insurance and all that stuff. Um, and he, he truly he actually went to the Yellow Pages and started looking up, you know, counselors and psychologists for <laughs> way, wayward son. Now, truth be told, he was also the proudest man on earth the day we sold that business for many millions of dollars. But uh, so he came around after a while to think that this entrepreneurial thing wasn't uh, so bad. But the, I mean, I guess the, the very darkest day in 42 years was taking my very junior, like 3% owner partner of my first business to, uh, to lunch one day at the Cattleman Restaurant on East 45th Street in Manhattan, around the corner from our office. We went there because we had a barter deal with the owner of the restaurant where we could eat like pigs and do some press work for him and call it even saying, Alex, here are the keys to the doors and the safe and the office and all that stuff. I've just been diagnosed with some really nasty stuff. I'm checking into a hospital in the morning, and if you can keep the wings on this airplane and have a job for me when I come back, I'll appreciate it. And if not, appreciate your you know, best efforts. And trying to be a itinerant, occasional manager of a business spending two months in a hospital worrying about far more important things was probably about as, as ugly as it can get. Uh, the second ugliest would be about four months later when I'm back to work and the company is deeply in debt, um, having a phone call from the receptionist, Mr. Dorf, there's an Agent Smith or whatever his name was here to see you. He has a gun. <laughs> it, you know, the, in the U.S. in the 70s, the fastest source of investment capital, and this, this could be on the record if the statute of limitations is passed, right? The fastest, sort of in, fastest source of investment capital, right? You, I'm sure you have the same system here in Canada where your, your uh, Canadian and Ontario taxes are taken out of your check safeguarded by your employer who forwards them on a timely basis to the government. When the 70s, the IRS wasn't computerized. And so if you had 20 employees, you had a pile of their money that you were safekeeping. It was an interest-free, immediate access loan. <laughs> now, two, so great, easy money, no application, no, no fee, no interest, Slightly whatever. Illegal. Right? The only wrinkle in that equation is that you know with certainty that A, you are personally liable for every penny of that money. The fact that you're running a corporation is irrelevant. And B, there are criminal, as in jail time, penalties. But because the IRS wasn't computerized, you could sort of slowly pay that money back by increasing the, the, the it was this wonderful sort of source of capital after you run out, ran out of the second easiest source of investment capital, which was a little note card I always had in the upper right-hand corner drawer of my desk. And it was a list of names, and there were always lines through it, and others moved up and down. Those were the people where I could go to you and say, Joe, listen, here's your paycheck, but do me a favor, just wait a couple days, make sure it goes through the bank okay the first time, 
and I would know my people well enough to know where, who you could get away with that with, and who just had a baby and really needed the money. And of course, goes without saying, as the founder, I was always number one on the list and wouldn't have it or think of it any other way. So those are, those are just a few of the many, many ugly uh, days. And I, I think the important thing is you know, it's very easy to, you know, wear my arm out saying, wow, eight IPOs, that's really, what an amazing track record. Nobody has eight IPOs. How smart I am. But will you really learn how to be a better founder by getting your head beat in, by starting a company, spending two or three hundred thousand dollars of your own money to launch it? and having it just run into a brick wall and then get hit by a ton of bricks. And, you know, then you go back and you say, well, gee, maybe I'm not the greatest genius on the planet. What did I learn? What am I going to do better, different, another way next time? And as Steve and I love to joke, this startup owner's manual, we believe in the 618 pages of the startup owner's manual, there are 500 stupid startup mistakes that he and I have personally made between us. Between us, we have almost 80 years of startup experience. And so that's an average of what? Uh, six, uh, yeah, six per man year in a, six really stupid bonehead mistakes that you never want to make again. And you learn those in your mistakes, not in your, you know, heralding your success. So you've uh, referred to the payday or the exit. Uh, that's clearly a highlight of any uh, founder's yeah. cycle. Uh, you've uh, talked about how that translates to a home where you reward the faithful. Uh, what you know, uh, I think founders, uh, you know, unlike for example academics who reach tenor, or un unlike people who have a career, I mean. You often don't get that magical moment where people, where where everybody on the outside, can you know grants you this status like wow, you have arrived. Now, are there you know, looking back or 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 across uh, the different startups, are there those kinds of moments that that founders should learn to recognize as as these are kind of milestones that you should savor. As as uh, as you encounter them, you may not recognize them. I don't know. I think that I, um, I mean, I remember when we sold our first company, which at that point was renamed Dorf and Stanton. We went from the meeting where they handed us a certified check for six. Not that I remember six point two seven million dollars, and before we went to the bank with the check, we stopped. These were in the days before. You know, iPhones, you know, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. We had to go to a photostat store to make a color photostat of the check, one for me and one for Stanton. Um, be, and it's still, you know, in a glass, you know, embedded in glass sitting on my shelf somewhere. Um, but I really think that the, the, um, the greater satisfaction uh, comes not not in the checks or the exits or the IPOs, but in the, for example, October 13th, 19, I'm sorry, October 13th, 2012, 40 years to the day after Dorf and Stanton, I founded it as Bob Dorf, Inc. I said, gee, what a day to just get people together. And we went to Pete's Tavern, this dump of a bar on 18th Street in Irving Place, where we always used to go and get drunk. And I said, I'm buying for the first three hours. I think it cost me $600. And in the course of the evening, I saw 60 people who felt good enough about this company they had worked at over almost 20 years to come by and see different vintages of old friends and the warmth and the camaraderie and the in fact the, the most interesting one was this guy Joe Ross who was a, a gay man in the late 70s when you were usually not that public about it Joe Ross brought his lady 
wife. He had given up on his partner, changes, and had switched from being a Marcom guy to being a school teacher in the ghetto. But he was still the same wonderful, warm, sweet, lovely guy, Joe Ross. And hadn't seen him in 25 years, and it was like yesterday. And the number of people who went on to do great things from their starts in that company was just an incredible sort of psychic reward. So I think you have to be careful to think about the way you measure your per your personal achievement, your own success and so forth. I had a funny experience just this past weekend. I came home from Moscow about noon on Saturday and I walk in the front door and I trip over a case of Diet Coke delivered by Amazon.com. And I said, what was I? Drinking? Well, who buys Diet Coke on it? from Amazon? It's got to be ridiculously overpriced. And did I do this to just test my Amazon Prime to see if it really worked? And I, the whole weekend, it was the mystery of what is this case of Diet Coke doing here? And one of my favorite consulting clients is a $2 billion sustainable venture fund uh, called the Acumen Fund. If you're not familiar with it, look it up, A-C-U-M-E-N. They have raised $2 billion in venture capital from investors who want no financial return whatsoever, period. What they want is sustainable improvement of life in the third world. So they fund sewer plants, fresh water delivery facilities, home building, uh, child care businesses with a goal of getting them to sustainable operating break even. It's my favorite client. And my joke with them is we're not going to talk about my fee. My fee for you is a Diet Coke an hour. And they realized I had hit my 32 hours. They sent me the 32 pack of Diet Coke. But I had no idea about that till Monday when I got an email about it. And so to me, hearing from there's a business in uh, Western uh, Nigeria that is helping kids work in the field till 7 or 8 o'clock every night and they now have in, in towns where there's no electricity, no running water and they can still do their homework because we've developed a methodology for pay as you go or what's sometimes called rent to own purchases of solar lanterns. So the kid can do all their chores, help the family grow the crop or whatever they have to do till dark and they can still do their homework and, you know, and so getting emails from these kinds of businesses gives you a rush that you can't imagine compared to you know yes we helped General Electric build an 80 million dollar business you know they won't even notice it in the P&L but it's still an interesting customer development achievement so I think and you, you need to early in your life as a founder think about what are those sort of markers that, that will make you happy? The non-monetary ones, the monetary ones are sort of obvious. You have an IPO and you're suddenly worth $100 million. Yeah, you can figure out that that's a good thing pretty easily. But what else will reward you, keep you going in the dark days? I think it's really vitally important. So uh, switch gears a little bit. Let's, uh, let's uh, delve into uh, the customer development. Uh, method a little bit, or perhaps you can just start with a, a brief, uh, in a nutshell, summary of the thesis. Don't you uh, know right? me well enough I, that I don't do anything brief? <laughs> um, well, do okay. you, what, I mean, I think people have a, a fairly good introduction to customer development, but we should, you know, uh, recap that a little bit, and then maybe a little bit about, so why is this um, a method that folks should ad adopt, and secondly, uh, what's the track record? Do you have you know, some evidence that this is a method that's working? Okay. Let's start with the hardest part first. Do we have any, any evidence? Well, there is no real database of, although you're hopefully going to solve that problem in the next year or two, no database of the longitudinal achievements of startups, particularly before they get to call it institutional or venture funding. 
right? In the U.S., there are 650,000 startups started a year, according to some sources. If I offered you $5 million, you couldn't come up with a list of those 650,000 for me. It's a sort of amorphous, sort of, uh, sort of vague network, if you will. I mean, to give, like, just to back up the, the, that statement, about 800 a day going on to AngelList, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, think about how small that sample then would be in, in sure. terms of that number. So how do you kind of um, uh, navigate from, you know, early day to, you know, benchmark achievements to the point where you have uh, the efficient opportunity to raise some capital. I think the great um, myth of capital raising is if I write a really cool business plan with a really great spreadsheet set at the back of it, and the last column of the last spreadsheet says this business is going to get to 100 million in revenue and 15 million in profit, you show it to enough venture capitalist, somebody's going to write you a check. In 96, 97, 98, 99, that was true. In 2013, that's about a one in a hundred shot if you are really lucky and you're working on something great. So the customer development method says do everything humanly possible to delay your fundraising as long as humanly possible so that when you are talking to investors, you are talking about a company with measurable, reportable, objective evidence of traction. Doesn't have to be thousands of customers, doesn't even have to be hundreds of customers. But you have to be able to say, we started here, we started talking to customers. We learned these things. We made these changes to our product, to our marketing, to our channel strategy, to our pricing, our cost structure, to any of the elements of our business model. We went back out and talked to more customers, and clearly magic didn't happen. So we, did, we learned this. We changed this. And this is the story of the evolution of our business. And as we sit here across from you today, Madam Investor, here are the 42 risks we have taken out of this business on your behalf. That doesn't mean there aren't 250 more risks, but look at all the mountains we have climbed in order to be here today and show you that we have learned how to go from getting two or three customers to six or eight or nine to 12 or 15 to 20. We're starting to get just a little bit of a ramp with a tiny bit of money and a hell of a lot of perspiration, determination, and shoe leather. And the farther you can delay that investor conversation, A, the more likely you are to get an investment, but even more important, the better you will preserve the equity for yourself and your founding team. Because, right, it's all about the pre-money valuation. And the more you've de-risked the investment and the more you've proven the viability of the business concept, the, you know, better the valuation and therefore the more money you can take in with less dilution to you and your fellow founders. So do we have scientific evidence of this that works? No. But what we have... Steve and I each have a love letter email file, probably now in the low hundreds of people who have used some aspects of the customer development methodology. And usually these love letters, oddly enough, come right after they've raised money. So I got one about two weeks ago from Las Partes in Bogota, Colombia. Dear Professor Bob, when we met you last September, we had no revenue, and you told us you hated our business idea. We are now doing $100,000 a month. We have $100,000 in investment in the bank. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can we buy you a cerveza the next time you're in Bogota? Right? And I have, like, a stack of those. 
I, what I don't have is, dear Bob, this really didn't work. It blew up in my face. I hate you. Eat it and die. But I'm, I'm sure there are a few of those out there on the internet. But I think that what we've seen, and I see, I, I have the privilege of meeting people like you all over the world and seeing the world through the eyes of my people, entrepreneurs, right? So a month ago, I was in Warsaw, Poland. I had a slightly more rousing welcome than here, which is unusual, but there were 3,000 entrepreneurs in the audience. And the number of people who came up to me and said, I struggled through your book in English a year ago. It changed my life. It changed my business. Also, for those of you who haven't seen the Startup Owner's Manual, this is not a book to sit back on your favorite chair and read, okay? This is more as if you bought the instruction manual for a riding lawnmower, and the only time you need it is when it doesn't go cut, or when the grass isn't getting cut, or when you have to change the carburetor or the blade, or whatever. This is a painfully, trust me, scars, right? 118,000 words, step by granular step in building a startup. It is not a Bible. It's not meant to be a religion. It's meant to be more of a roadmap. And if you were driving from here to Vancouver, you'd have a roadmap. But you'd see a whole lot of beautiful scenery and you'd veer off the road here and there, just as with the manual. There are times you put it down, you follow your entrepreneurial instinct, you skip a couple steps, you reinvent a couple steps, but it's sort of a, I think the easiest way to think about it is it's a roadmap, it's a baseline. So when you feel a little lost, or like one of my favorite sections is uh, website optimization, and it's the easiest way to write this section is let's take the most common questions and provide sort of suggestions in how you deal with them. I have a website and nobody comes to it. Okay, here's 10 things to do. They're coming to it, but they're not staying. Here's 10 things to do. They're coming to it and they're staying, but they're not giving me their email address. Okay, here's 10 things to do. They're giving me their email address, nobody's giving me any money. Try this. And so it's sort of prescriptive ways to think about, again, Steve and I learned this the hard way. Go spend $40,000 on a website and get eight or 10 visitors a day Trust me, it's a great way to learn how to optimize web traffic, you know, so, um, so, um, and, you know, so we have, uh, I think Steve has the record, he had a team three weeks out of his Lean Launchpad program at Stanford, got $1.8 million in top tier venture financing for a robotic weeder, a what's it called? Carrot bot. It dry, it, uh, and the business evolved. Originally it was going to be a robotic lawnmower for big, you know, like college campuses and things like that. And everybody said they were out of their minds. It was too expensive and we already have this solved with lots of low wage labor and we already own all the lawnmowers. We don't really need an $80,000 lawnmower no matter how smart it is. Thank you, never mind. Customer discovery lesson number one. Lesson number eight was organic crops have to be hand weeded. In the United States, we have all these guys running around wearing hats that say INS, Immigration and Naturalization Service. When somebody shows up on your organic farm in an INS hat, your labor force vanishes in 30 <laughs> seconds. And now you have all these weeds eating the carrots and killing the lettuce and so forth, and you are in serious trouble. The robot has a passport and an H-1B visa, so it, and it literally sends a squad of lasers down the row of lettuce. One set says, is that a weed or is that a lettuce? And it's, oh, it's a weed. Okay, laser number two, shoot it, and it kills it while this thing is rolling. They, Three weeks after they completed their MVP, their minimum viable robot weeder development, they got $1.8 million in venture financing. And we have scores of those kinds of anecdotal, non-scientific examples and a robust conversation going on with the Kaufman Foundation, a wonderful source of 
it's like a treasure trove of entrepreneurial information. Kaufman, K-U-F-M-A-N-N.org, based in Kansas City. All the entrepreneurial tools, support, videos, library you could ever use, all of it free, uh, help yourself. Um, and so what we're working on now with Kaufman is to try to do longitudinal studies of companies, you know, from inception. If uh, Kaufman did a very scary study just last year about incubators where in some isolated test cells, hopefully not true of too many incubators, companies that didn't get into the incubator outperformed those that did. Uh, so I'm sure there are companies who didn't do customer development who have gone to the moon and back at least a few times as well. But it's particularly for first or second time entrepreneurs or for, we wrote the book right, talking about every company, every startup needs to have a customer archetype in mind. What does your dream date customer look like? Where do they work? What's their job title? What do they earn? What do they, what do they drive? What do they drink? So you know who you're talking to. And our customer archetype, so we said, gee, we ought to have one of those for the book, writing about customer archetypes. Who are we writing this book for? And we sort of came to the consensus. We're writing it for a 25-year-old engineer who doesn't know any, doesn't know what marketing is except going to the supermarket doesn't know what selling is, has very little understanding of business, but has technology vision and needs, if you will, the other eight boxes of the business model canvas. And so that's probably the person who will find the book the most helpful, uh, you know, of all. So we're going to uh, come for some questions here in a second, so get, get ready. Um, the, uh, uh, you mentioned a stack of endorsements. Uh, out of all the endorsements that you've received for customer development, you know, who is the person or what's the one that you respect the most? God, I don't know. Um, well, actually, maybe, maybe it's the Dean of Entrepreneurship at Columbia Business School. If he was chasing me to have a cup of coffee Murray Lowe is his name. He actually has a PhD in entrepreneurship, which you might consider to be an oxymoron. Uh, <laughs> um, but he, and he got it. What he did was he did three startups, made some money on the third one, decided he really wanted to learn more about entrepreneurs and how they tick, and he went to Wharton and found somebody to study under. And for two or three months, he's emailing me, hey, we both live in Stanford, Connecticut. We really ought to have coffee sometime. And usually when I get emails like that, it's somebody who's trying to get to me to get to Steve Blank. And so I'm always about time efficiency, as you should always be. So I try to get them to declare their intentions in email. Finally, I got this sort of snarky email from, you know, so I say, so what's on the agenda? What are we So he finally wrote back, almost nasty. What's on the agenda is a lot of people have told me I ought to meet you. I'd like to have a cup of coffee. It's really that simple. I said, okay, you're on. I'll buy. You know, big sport. <laughs> and so the, the, the honor was, he wasn't there to get anything out of Steve. He wanted me, a kid who barely got through college. I did get through, but barely got through college, mostly because I was too busy launching biz wacky, crazy businesses and stuff. To, you know, why go to class when you can learn so much more getting your head beat in in the market? Um, <laughs> He wanted this kid who, who couldn't have gotten into Columbia Business School with a gun and a million dollars to come in and teach entrepreneurship there. That was probably, and uh, I will tell you, and I tell that story to my students at the beginning of every semester. It was also my mother who passed recently at 89 and a half. Professor of entrepreneurship at Columbia was the first of my nine careers she could actually explain and understand. You know, oh, he does, he does CRM strategy for Fortune 200 corporations and systems integrate. Oh, yeah, right, Mom. Okay, you got it. Uh, and the, to see the pride in her sort of eyes was, was probably a, and it's a good example. It, it pays exactly what I pay my cleaning lady, but she gets 
entitled to the same hourly rate because she's bilingual. But the, um, the, the honor of being asked to, you know, is really a not good example of non-monetary compensation, I think. So. so I'm Kamal Hassan, CEO of VentureLinks. We're a platform for entrepreneurs to help entrepreneurs get ready for funding. Question for you, Bob. You talked about the, uh, the company which within six weeks it got $1.6 in venture capital. Have you ever seen that happen anywhere other than Silicon Valley or maybe New York? Moscow. Uh, I had yes. one. Um, <laughs> One in um, Moscow that was basically a clone of Square. So the value proposition was obvious. The traction potential was obvious. They walked out of my classroom and two weeks later had a million sick. They're also, the, the investor community in Russia is 25 people, each of whom is worth $10 billion. So <laughs> writing a $1.6 million check is like you or me buying a cup of coffee. It is still quite anomalous and it is not a reasonable expectation most of you i don't right i don't know much about any of your businesses other than a few of I, you i got over pizza most of you are going whether you're here or basically any place other than silicon valley and 20 percent of the time in new york you are going to spend an inordinate amount of your time having conversations with investors, and the first conversation is going to be about $100,000 or $200,000. And you're going to have meeting after meeting, and they're going to want to see not just you, the founder, but your leadership team. Because uh, the best way I've really heard it explained is if you think of the two ends of the investing spectrum, over here you have the seed angel end, and over here you have the series A and B end. At this end, there are no numbers to evaluate. There's virtually no historical corporate or you know startup performance data to evaluate. Here, the investment is all you, you and the team. Do I, the investor, have twenty-five, fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars worth of confidence that this team can take this? idea, one of the thousands of startup ideas floating around in Toronto, shake it, iterate it, pivot it, get it to something where I can get my money back. But there's so little data to evaluate at this end of the spectrum. At this end of the spectrum, you don't matter. Because if you really get this Series A thing right, the odds are overwhelming you're going to get fired. Because once the investors say, holy crap, we got a winner here. We don't want this first-time CEO screwing it up. Let's bring in some big shot, big name, serial CEO, hired gun. And they have tons of data to evaluate and compare and so forth. Big fan of VC, huh? Uh, um, <laughs> but, um, but I guess the, the, the point is the... In Silicon Valley, so much money has been made and there are so many big bets placed that any fund, any major valley fund can throw $2 million at you and not even care whether you succeed or not because, you know, Google or Facebook or Square or Foursquare is in Fund 14 and that's going to make 90% of the money, and it's going to wash out all the failures. So you seem like a nice lady. It seems like a pretty good idea. I kind of like your team. Sure, here's a million. I'll come back. You know, Don't bother me too much, but call me in a couple of months. Tell me how it's going. That's the anomaly. Do you have a card? <laughs> if you take rubber checks, I have a card. Now, so, but, but that's the anomaly. That is truly the way it was even in New York in 97, 98, 99. It was like drunks in a casino. Here's a pile of money, put it on 17. Here's another pile of money, put it on black. Because there was this fervor, and that fervor was dramatically extinguished in April of 2000 when the NASDAQ dropped, what, 5,000 points in 72 hours. And all, and I mean, I had a my favorite IPO of all time, a dollar invested at a brief moment in time in December, January 99, was $906 to one. 
90 days later, it was six dollars to one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I sold some of it. Or never sold enough of it, but sold a nice pile of it. You know, earlier on, and that has changed, in my opinion, changed the investor climate forever. Right? It's uh, it's changed the definition of a home run. A home run in the mid late 90s was a hundred x return on your money. The easiest way to hit more home runs is to redefine the home run as 10 to 12x on your money, which is pretty much where it is now. And lots of VC funds are happy with 3 to 5x. The only problem with that is that's got to be a portfolio-wide average or your investors are going to A, shoot you, and B, never invest with you again. So it so I guess just to bring this back to customer development for this is why you need to do everything you can without raising money to demonstrate traction and momentum in your business and to keep evolving and refining the idea with sweat and shoe leather and your MasterCard limit so that when you go to that investor, you've taken some number of pounds of risk out of the idea so that you can get an investment decision in a reasonable amount of time so you can stay focused on your number one job, which is building your business, not finding investors. Any other questions? Go ahead. So, so you mentioned your favorite client is the Acumen Fund. So how do we um, support more social entrepreneurs where they may not be well, I think two ways. The easiest way is there are lots of social venture funds. Write them a check. The other, which is something all of you can do without writing them a check, is make yourself available to help them succeed. If you're an e-marketing expert and you come across a not-for-profit that you like, help them develop an e-marketing fundraising or awareness campaign. If you're a back-end developer and somebody needs help in something you believe in to build the infrastructure for their database or their website or whatever, give them your time and talent. It's a wonderful, very rewarding way to, you know, give back without writing a check. Um. Okay, so maybe a little perspective again, just recapping some of the numbers that you've been mentioning. So 650,000 startups, uh, you know, about 800 a day that are going on to AngelList. Uh, and you've mentioned several times this, pros this, this notion of a prospect of, of becoming a $100 million company, <laughs> right? So how many, how, many, how many founders again here? How many startups again? So how many people think that they have a business that's going to make $100 million a year? Right. Okay. So, okay. right. Uh, so that's a lot of that's a pretty bullish crowd. Given yep. given that. So so what is it about customer development that you know that could help warrant that kind of optimism? Well, I think um, more important than that is what are the other the people who don't think they're going to get to 100 million dollars going to do? Because they. It doesn't mean they need to give up or be despondent. Uh, you can build a beautiful, profitable, sustainable five or ten or four or eight million dollar business that can reward you very generously, that can challenge you every day for the rest of your career, that can give you enough you know, room in the payroll to hire really talented people and do really great stuff. What you won't do as a consequence of that is have some big boom IPO thing at the end of it. Doesn't mean you can't make great money, put your kids through college, buy a nice house and a nice car, and be excited to get up and go to work every day of your professional life. The, and the customer development methodology can help you get that right early and, you know, and sort of as long as you're honest with yourself and particularly with your co-founders and your investors about what's our trajectory. 
because to build a five or six million dollar profitable business, you don't talk to VCs. You talk to entirely different classes of long-term investors, often to debt investors, um, because you're not VC ready. That doesn't mean it's a bad business or you shouldn't do it or anything like that. Um, if you are really shooting for the moon, for the hundred million plus, you're really going to hate this thought. And this thought is you should be spending three or four months at the beginning of that journey not selling anything and not building anything other than core sort of unchangeable elements of your business. And you should spend almost all of your time in those first four months, talking to customers, getting out of the building, doing customer discovery to, to be sure that whatever it is you are going to build is the best possible, most distinctive, unusual, highly valued thing, and that it solves a serious problem for a sizable universe of customers almost certainly beyond Canada, because getting to $100 million in Canada is a relatively unusual, you know, occurrence for a startup sitting, you know, in this room today. So it's a matter of understanding sort of at the outset, are you, you know, aiming, you know, for the moon, or are you aiming for, you know, runway three at Lester Pearson, either one of which can be a very successful uh, outcome do you have to be aiming for the moon in order to hit runway? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Um, um, okay, so uh, other questions? Oh, go ahead. <coughs> I'd just like to talk a little bit about the idea. You know, the importance of the idea. How defined does an idea have to be? Is it, you know, like Mark Anderson's talking about the idea, the team, the market. It's the most important. If you only have two, which do you have? Well, okay, so. The idea of the team and the market, if you can only have two, which two? I would take the team and the market any day on the bold premise that whatever idea you walk in here with tonight, by the time it's a successful business, it's going to be tortured and twisted and changed a bunch of times. And that will only be done successfully by a persistent, tenacious, passionate team that can, you know, whack them across the side of the head with a two-by-four today. They'll go home, they'll put the Band-Aids on, they'll get a good night's sleep, take a bottle of aspirin, they'll be back at it with full gusto the next morning. Um, you know, Mark Andreessen is the one who also, right, we talk in the sort of customer development lexicon about the pivot. Oh, crap, this business isn't working. We need to make a dramatic change in one of the fundamental elements of that business. Uh, Mark Andreessen said, I don't know where this word pivot came from. We used to call it a cock up uh, <laughs> or something worse. Uh, and, um, uh, and he's probably right. But I think the difference in the current startup attitude is what they often refer to as fail fast. Better to hit the brick wall before you spent all the investors' money or before you even raised it than to hit it on the day you're launching with champagne and balloons and suddenly find out that you're the only one who thinks you have this brilliant idea for a business. And that, you know, it can be a very lonely time. Other questions? Uh, what are your thoughts on incubators? Because right now in Toronto, there's lots of incubators coming up. Next. Would you recommend it for like a startup to actually go into an incubator or not? Uh, hmm. How much is an incubator worth on top of that? A pile on to that question. I think it totally depends. I have seen horrible incubators, and I've seen a few really great ones. Uh, horrible ones force you to sit down for two hours a week where somebody's reading slides to you about some aspect of business or law or whatever, and force you to sit with somebody who doesn't give a crap about your business, where they spout off about how smart they are and how much they know, and they call that mentoring. Uh, uh, and the incubator's primary interest is to get your monthly rent check, because they know 6% of your company 
is never going to be worth as much as the month's rent. Uh, and they treat you just that way. And so incubators are, and I, uh, I do a tremendous amount of work in Latin America, and I have seen, keep this out of anything you might write, I've seen more horrible incubators there than anywhere, where it's, gee, I own this office building, why don't I make two floors of it, I'll call two floors of it an incubator, and uh, collect a whole lot of rent from a whole bunch of you know startups dreaming about their IPO, um, and uh, you have to screen incubators as thoroughly as you would screen a co-founder or a CTO. Don't just talk to the references they give you. Go back and find their website from a year ago and see what companies were there then find the ones that failed out, find the ones that, six, in other words, don't take the reference list they hand you, that's going to be stacked. And, you know, hey, can we come hang out here for a couple of days and just have coffee with a bunch of people? And if they say no, you know, red alert. So, and I think you have to really think of an incubator the way you would an investor. There's lots of dumb money, bad investors who just want to beat you, you know, they. They, you know, the dog died because they kicked it so many times. The wife said, if you beat me one more time, I'm calling the, you know, RCMP. Uh, so they need somebody new to whip. And you're lucky you, for $25,000, they got a new dog to kick. Um, as opposed to one who says, this is an industry I know. I know a lot of people in this industry. I can make a lot of introductions for these people, and I can help them turn my $25,000 into hundreds of thousands, not for them, for my own selfish interest. So again, who have they invested in? Did they really do what they said? And so on and so forth. And I think if you... Incubators have gotten so ubiquitous that it is no longer an honor to be called to serve. You have to be vigilant about making sure that it's really going to add value, not because they say so, but because it's been proven in their past experience with other startups. You know. How about uh, government-funded incubators versus private sector incubators? Um, well, I like the government-funded models. Uh, for example, Brazil has a model where they uh, give money to existing incubators, but the um, wait, they give money to uh, private sector incubators. Private sector okay. incubators, but the private sector incubator is not entitled to a management fee on the government money, uh, and the government gets its traditional return. But basically, what they're doing is being an accelerant to existing incubators. So they provide it, the money as a fund, like an to a fund, to an existing oh, fund. So a yeah. fund that's attached to an right. incubator. Right. Okay. Uh, but the, the difference is governments are typically, and I don't know if Canada is an exception to this, but in most of the world, governments have repeatedly proven that they are not good stock pickers. I mean, right? The United States government is going to lose God knows how many billions on General Motors, not to mention a billion on Solyndra. The U.S. Small Business Administration, I think, is at this rate lost about three and a half billion so if, they, if the government money can be catalytic, it can fund advisors or reduce the operating burden on startups or incubators, that kind of model I like a lot. But when, you know, hi, this is your government. I can't get anything right in what I'm doing in my day job, so I'm going to tell you how to do your startup. I don't know anything about startups, but in this book it says you should be doing this. That's not the kind of help. You need so yeah. I say that absent any knowledge of the yeah. Canadian government yeah, I, I involved. Mean, I think uh, you know there's there's uh, a government money in almost all of the incubators that are active in Ontario at least, yeah. but there are a few private sector ones that uh, that stand out, and uh, there are there are, are you know private sector models associated with each of the government funds funded uh -huh. models, but but uh, you know we'll we'll talk about that over drinks afterwards. Go ahead. Um, I have a question. You said you're an angel investor. You've been going around uh, spreading the word on your customer development model. So presumably a lot of the startups these days are at least looking into that model. So 
beyond that, what are three to five things that you want to see in a company before you put a dollar view? Um, beyond, beyond team and traction, not much. Uh, I guess the other is, you know, is, is there a big enough market for this to be a sustainable long, you know, business for the long term? In other words, uh, uh, anyone can sort of, you know, inf not anyone, most, most clever entrepreneurs can find a way to get that initial ramp. But the initial ramp doesn't yield any return to investors. It's got to be sustainable enough to, you know, get through the exit and so forth, get through. I mean, I got a check the other day for an investment I made 13 years ago for like $100,000 was the release of an escrow from a sale, which meant that the company did everything it said it was going to do. Uh, in its sale to a, a larger company. It's the first time in 13 years that company did everything it said it was going to do. I was in shock when I opened the envelope. But, like, you know, but um, the, I, I think the other thing is how do you, um, most businesses need to continue to grow to maintain their talent pool you know, more than anything, right? I'm only going to be a director for so long, then I want to be a vice president and so forth. And so usually that's fueled by <clears throat> organic growth. Lots of sort of uh, uh, flash in the pan kinds of companies probably never should have been a company in the first place. They should have been a product within a larger company or a um, you know, division of a bigger enterprise. And so one of the questions I like to ask, and for the record, I, when I started teaching, I stopped investing because you'll never know if I'm telling you this story because I want you to buy this stock or I'm crapping on your idea because I want to see you later and, you know, bid the price down. So I just, I, you know, I figured the easiest way to solve that problem is to stop doing it. But the other, I think, thing is... Uh, you know, do they have a strong bench? Do they, you know, if the CTO gets bored after year five, is there somebody, you know, behind him or her ready to move in? Because you really are investing for the long term, not the short term in most situations, particularly in the, you know, in the current economic climate. Chad, I just wanted to get your thoughts on crowdfunding or crowd investing and get started capital. Um, this is a bit of a contrarian view, but I sort of hate it. I don't really believe in sorta. it. Sort of? Sort of hate it. Sort of hate it. Uh, <laughs> I think the, um, and I think it's already, you know, the bloom is already fading from the rose as you have all these crowdfunded gigas and gizmos that weren't delivered on time and refunding money to people and uh, to, you know not living up to their original promises and things like that and uh, right the original sort of premise if you will of crowdfunding was uh, to give catalytic investments to early stage startups that couldn't raise money in traditional ways and what it's turned into in my opinion is sort of a flea market of stuff you know, gadgets and gizmos, what, uh, I happen to have giant feet, so I recently put $75 in for fashionable giant socks, you know, like Christmas stockings that go in your shoes, about the size of it. You know, and I got the email a week ago, sorry we didn't make it, we're out, you're, you know, your, your credit card's been destroyed or whatever. And I, I, I don't think it's a sustainable model for really launching a business unless you need to build a set of tools for a physical product or a set of code for a digital product and there's sort of a one hump to get over until you are at least break even or somewhat sustainable uh, and then you are under pressure to actually deliver on your promises. There was a horrible story a month or so ago in 
TechCrunch or someplace about some people who developed some new physical product and all of a sudden got, you know, like 2,500 orders for it and they had made a prototype and they had ideas of how they were going to build it. And it was, oh crap, we got to deliver 2,500 of these things in 60 days. And then they quickly learned about the difference between ocean freight from China and air freight from China, which took each piece from positive to negative cash flow. All of a sudden, they're, you know, reality set in. I had a team this week at uh, Columbia Business School where now they have three customers who want what they're selling, and they can't figure out how to make it. I got, you know, guys, uh, you know. <laughs> I know this is an extraordinary stroke of luck to, you know, in your first 20 customer discovery interviews to have three buyers, but didn't you think that maybe that would happen? And your second year business school students, didn't you understand that manufacturing came before delivery and revenue? And, or, you know, that, that's not my course. You should have learned that in like fourth grade. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I have a Oh, and, and I sort of put crowdfunding in the same class as winning uh, prize money in venture, you know, in business plan competitions. You say, wow, look at this. We made $20,000 this month. Well, it was a one-time check from Microsoft or Oracle or Dell or somebody. It was prize money. That's not repeatable, scalable revenue unless you, you know, have figured out the secret to winning all those business plan competitions, and you know there are three a month times twenty thousand dollars. That's a revenue model I'd love to fool around with. But so it's, it's in a way, it's sort of not honest revenue. I guess is the way I think of it. Can I, say that a small I agree with you. I think I think crowdfunding is more about rewards and perks and donations, right? But let's just say when the job act finally gets realized. I think the jury's way out on that. We've been through the years of dentists investing in early stage tech. I had a few investor dentists with me in one deal. It's like, why'd you do this? Why didn't you just use buy a dartboard and <laughs> you know put stock names on it and throw dart? You know. Um, I think it's very dangerous, and I think it could really uh, hurt itself very quickly because the, the thing that makes customer development so important, the thing that makes working your butt off so important is at the end of the day, I don't care how smart you are, I don't care how good your idea is, more than 97% of all startups fail in an ugly pile of blood and pus and bones and perspiration and tears. So why is your dentist or my dentist going to pick the three out of a hundred that might return modestly on his or her investment? And that's why theoretically, you know, there are qualified investors and there are you know, seasoned venture capitalists. I mean, the other thing we forget when I sort of, I, there's two ugly facts. In the incubator business, almost all of the money made by all incubated companies of all time came from Y Combinator or Techstars, period. That leaves thousands of other incubators scraping for the other 10 or 20 percent of all the money made. In venture capital, Right? You know, you can name them on one hand, NEA, Sequoia, Kleiner, you know, one or two others probably responsible for more than 50% of all the money made in all time in venture capital and fully a third of the venture capital funds that existed in 2000 have vanished from the earth and not been replaced. And if you look at the return of the venture capital asset class over the last decade, if you remove Google and Facebook from the last 10 years, the annual IRR of the venture capital industry minus 6% per annum. And right? worse in Canada. Huh? And worse, and worse, and worse in Canada. Canada. Okay? <laughs> so, you know, it's sort of... Uh, 
you know, there are, pick a number, there are a thousand brain surgeons in the United States. If you need brain surgery, do you want somebody in the top ten or the bottom hundred? <laughs> and I think the same is true when you're picking winners, particularly knowing that 97 of your winners are not going to live. And so, um, you yeah, know, and I've done a bunch of venture investing. It was a, not a happy time for me, partly because the timing was bad and also because I'm sort of Teutonic. I like, when you're an investor, you're always coaching and advising and sort of building consensus. I sort of like being a CEO. Do this. If you don't do this, she'll do it tomorrow and you'll be working on your resume. Are we understand each other, right? You know, very simple, straight, you know, and, and you can't do that as an investor ever because first you have to build a consensus among the investors then you have to gently kind of cuddly approach the CEO and say you know all your investors we know you're in charge and you're the CEO but we all kind of think you ought to fire these nine people do this change that yeah, and and you it, you really sort of emasculate the CEO at that point you might as well run the company yourself and, uh, so I, I think so uh, are, are those uh, it sounds like a huge problem right to try to address uh, a 97% failure rate in traditional uh, in investing. Uh, VC is a one in ten game in the best uh, amongst the best investors. The best VCs do the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, that's like you know 15 people, right? <laughs> right? That are kind of responsible for that, um, and uh, the remainder are kind of fighting for the remain for a fraction of of the overall scraps. Scraps, right? Yeah. So, you know, is that just the nature of the game, or is there a more productive approach? I mean, a, a, I think the customer development is at least a, a step towards the notion that there's a more productive approach. Um, so, are there? Do you see those numbers changing uh, through big data, or through uh, through the adoption of lean and customer development methods? Or, I mean, can we build a model like the housing industry did? with those assumptions. Uh, well, uh, I think personally the best thing that can happen for your country and mine is that we return to ro robust sort of economic growth in the core industries in our countries because the first thing that will do to the startup community is it will take the 30 or 40 percent of the people who say, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm doing a startup because I couldn't get a job, it'll get them back into mainstream employment and it will automatically upgrade the caliber of the ideas and the startups and the startup teams. And uh, so I think that's really job number one. I think job number two is another third of venture capitalists are going to vaporize. There are so many scores of them are struggling now to, well, you're going to raise money based on your past performance. If your past performance is a zero, why exactly would I invest new money with you? Um, and so, so I, you know, I think there will be something of a purge. I've had the privilege of doing a bunch of, uh, probably 10 years ago now, sort of company fix-it work for Sequoia. Right? Sequoia is about uh, Sequoia and Kleiner are as good as it gets in the world of venture capital. And when you go to Sequoia's headquarters on Sand Hill Road, which is a requirement, they make you sit at the reception desk, you know, at the, in the reception area for 10 minutes. Why? Because behind the receptionist is a 40 inch screen flicking through all of the logos of their IPOs back to. Fairchild Semiconductor in the early 1950s, a small company you may have heard of called Hewlett Packard, where Sequoia was the A round investor, another one, Apple, and then a few Johnny come latelys like Google and Facebook. And you're just watching, it's like who's who in successful startups parading before your eyes. It's probably the second best thing like that I've ever seen. The other one is that. Uh, Bessemer in Rockefeller Center in New York City where there's this giant brass plaque in the lobby. Our first hundred IPOs 
sort of makes just a bit of a statement. And I think, A, it will be a healthier climate for the founders to walk into a place and come out with a straight answer because most venture capitalists waste immense amounts of your time because like the Japanese, they never want to say no just in case this might turn out to be Google. I don't want to be the one who said no to it. So please go back, do a spreadsheet, do it this way. Let me see it in 14 point flush left. <laughs> see what would happen if you grew at 3% a month instead of 2% a quarter, and then we'll talk some more. So you run back and say, wow, these VCs are interested. Everybody, stop work. We're working on this presentation. And you take your eye off your business for a week. Then the guy you know, doesn't answer the phone. A month later, you get to go in, OK, well, now think about this. Or, you know, and it, it's a huge time sump that, worse than the time, is taking your eye off your number one job as a founder, which is to build a great company. You build a great company the investors will call you. And companies are not sold, they're bought. When we were doing, the word got out that we were thinking about taking outside money for my last startup, one to one, we were buried in calls. It took, you know, it just, we wound up getting eight term sheets, range of uh, pre money from 80 to 150, 100, I think the top one was 160. Uh, from people who knew nothing about our business to people who really knew a lot, and we wound up somewhere in the middle. Um, but that company wasn't sold, it was bought. It was, oh my God, look at these numbers, look at the team, other than the CEO, he's a whack job, we've got to get rid of him, you know. Uh, and, uh, and, when you, and I had that with my first company too, we had four offers. It's really fun. In fact, the, Great. We went to one of the offers was from Interpublic, one of the global ad agency networks, and they were actually the ones who started the bidding and caused us to say, "Well, gee, if they're interested, maybe there are others. Let's see what happens." So we sort of dragged our feet in the conversations with Interpublic for a while. Finally, the guy said, "Look, we, you know, I really want to get together. Let's have dinner." And we figure we're either going to lose this or show up for dinner. So we go to dinner. He says, "So you had a chance to consider our offer." Yeah, we have. So, so what do you think? And, well, and this guy was there, you know, like world-class vintage M&A guy. Well, we think it needs some work. He says, well, what do you got in mind? We said, well, it would sort of probably start with doubling the, <laughs> the price and without missing a beat. Check, please. I mean, I swear, it was like he had rehearsed. You know, okay, dinner's over, never mind, this is off. And, that was, you know, we were fully prepared and sort of expecting that. And so the, the point is, it doesn't get bought because of your PowerPoint, because of your spreadsheets. It gets bought because of your traction, because of your momentum. Let me give you one great, fabulous example. Go read about Mailbox.com. Mailbox.com had no money like most of you, or no money to speak of like most of you, and was launching a new way to use your inbox to manage your life, as so many of us do. We have send ourselves reminders about lunches or to dos or appointments. They were going to organize and sort of, you know, uh, build a data infrastructure to run your life through your mailbox. A lot of development work, a lot of time, reasonable amount of money behind them. So they started doing some viral marketing, cute little videos about how you can fix your life and so on and so forth. Sign up now to be one of the first users of Mailbox.com. Before they had the product done, before they had the product launched, they had collected 750,000 email addresses of people who wanted to be one of the first to download Mailbox.com. So what did they do? Did they keep building the company? Hell no. They sold it to Dropbox for $100 million in cash, gave Dropbox the code and said, good luck, have a nice day. <laughs> right? So they created traction. No revenue, no code to QA. Right? They created, they showed that they had, right, if you go back to product market fit, 
right? They found a market, 750,000 people eager to have better inboxes and a rough idea of a product that would have product market fit with that market. $100 million cash, no code. Yeah, no. Okay, so we're uh, getting close to wrapping up here. Uh, so how many people came here, uh, wanted something, a uh, nugget of information or a question, still haven't found it? What's that? Free copy of the book. <laughs> There's no such thing as a free lunch, but we'll work on it. I may have a couple of... There's two here. There's one there. So there's one there. There's like, okay, so we got four or five questions. So let's uh, keep the questions short and the uh, and maybe I'll answer them. Because, uh, no, yeah, I'm just kidding. Go. Uh, I was hoping you just talk a little bit about uh, companies that have done a really good job uh, either entering a new market, creating a new market, or resegmenting as a niche. Like, what, what do the companies that do that really well um, in terms of pulling customers from existing markets into the niche or into the new market? What do they do? Like, do they have common characteristics? Uh, wow. Uh, tough question. I think. I'm not sure this is a great answer. It's a, it's a difficult question. I probably need a, either two glasses of wine or an hour to come up with a really good answer. Uh, so go to Ocho afterwards. Uh, <laughs> the, I think the, the most important thing a company has to do when it's resegmenting an existing market is get attention for itself and its differentiators between, you know, from, you know, why am I better than Oracle or SAP or whatever? And in the cluttered sort of marketplace of today's internet world, you can't do that with data sheets and ordinary facts and press releases. You have to do it by being engaging, by being sort of pre, by being viral or viral able, so to speak. Um, and you have to uh, usually, or where you can, use humor or outrage, you know, you know, to get get some attention. So one example that comes to mind is uh, a company in Eastern Europe called Bulldog Software, which had no money, and it was a different kind of security software.